Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for our first Road Salt Roundtable. We have presentations from a variety of professionals around the topic of road salts, their use, their impact, and how to be smarter and more efficient in the future. Our first presenter is Phil Sexton from WIT Advisors on Sustainable Winter Management. Excellent. Thanks, Krista. I'm just going to try to make sure I can um, get this up first. So can you all see that now? You're I can good? see it. Yep. It's uh, not in presenter mode yet, though. Just yeah, I'll, uh, let me do that right now for you. Okay. How's that look? Very good. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I'm uh, I'm with a firm called WIT Advisors or Wood Advisors. It's actually a firm that I founded uh, over 10 years ago, and and a lot of it had to do with with the issue that we're dealing with tonight. But just to give you a little bit of further background. We uh, we oversee uh, several different uh, business models uh, within the what I call the green and snow industry, and. Um, you know, sustainable winter management uh, is mainly what, what I'll discuss uh, this evening, um, but we are the industry advisors to the Snow and Ice Management Association as well. I actually worked on their staff for, for a number of years um, prior to, to doing what I'm doing now, mainly developing uh, industry standards and, and training for the industry. And, we, you know, within that role, develop something called the Sustainable Salt Initiative, um, which we've actually... Uh, taken over really overseeing that. And that's, that's, that's a, I'll get into a little bit more detail with it, but that's a program where we're actually, we've been measuring salt application for a number of years, just because there really was no standard or no benchmark, particularly for the private side of the salt application industry. And uh, so we've, we've tried to help facilitate that. And then um, within our uh, umbrella also is a co-op of, of, uh, primarily landscape companies and, and uh, vendors or manufacturers uh, for the uh, landscape and winter management industry, we brand as the uh, the WIT collaborative. And, you know, really just, just important to note that a lot of my background or most of my background when it comes to this really comes at the practitioner side of, of salt application, where I was at one point... Um, a partner of the largest firm in the private side of the industry that was applying this. So, so, and, and the last role that I played in that business was uh, I oversaw 102 different locations uh, overseeing only our snow management business. And so we were, we were essentially the, the, the single largest private user of salt use in the industry. And, and little did I know back in those days how much of a problem salt was or road salt as we're discussing. And so I, I take that pretty seriously in that in, in some ways I joke, but in a serious way that, you know, a lot of my work today trying to help facilitate salt reduction initiatives really boils down to this, this is a little bit of my penance actually for not knowing uh, any better at the time. And so, and I think you'll find that's just generally still what's happening is um, we were just discussing, I think, We've been working on this for over 10 years, tr trying to help uh, with salt, different salt reduction initiatives really all over North America. And um, it's been it's been, I think, up until this year, uh, kind of a tough road because it's 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 a pollution problem at, at what I call an ap epidemic level that almost nobody knows about. And so I think it's important that we we sort of think about it that way is most of the general public has zero idea that there's a problem with road salt and if anything it's 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 the primary tool used for you know business continuity and safety and you know whatever you might perceive as a quality level of service and so we we do we do term all this uh more as a business to business model and in, in, in our work as as swim or the sustainable winter management program uh, which is a set of standards, um, but we do we do it in a way where, in many cases, I think where a lot of our success boils down to helping facilitate what I call significant re reductions in salt use. Fifty percent or more is really what we're always shooting for. Is we 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 sort of make the business case for it uh, more so than you know discuss salt as a problem. So in a lot of in a lot of cases, our our strategy includes many times not even making about the salt, at least up, not up front and making more about, 
you know, what, what's the pain that you're feeling in your business or in your operation? I mean, we work with both private and public organizations. We work with municipalities. We work with contractors. We work with, you know, large retailers. A lot, a lot of the owners of these, these public and private spaces that have, you know, a, a large footprint of, of asphalt or, or, you know, uh, you know, impervious surface. And so, what SWIM really is, what it boils down to is SWIM is a, a set of standards of both policy and process that we help, we help whoever really wants to help, we help guide them through that. So it's meant to be a, a multi-phase continuous improvement system that, you know, incorporates different measures and decision-making methods, you know, very much data-driven. And then what we try to insert with that is, is a level of accountability that really boils down to both, you know, establishing a, set, a standard set of training, both for operators and really for, for anyone that's even requesting salt use. And then also uh, we, we do provide a, a certification when those are looking for it. it you know, our, our model was never designed to be necessarily a certification scheme. It was, it was rather, um, rather meant to be for those that really wanted that recognition that they were doing something, you know, more sustainably, or, you know, in some cases it is being used as an accountability tool. And so there's, there's definite reasons for why certification has, has for whatever reason become more important. And so I'll just show you this quickly, like what swim really boils down to is, is really over a hundred uh, different guidelines that this is how we certify, but this is really how we, how we facilitate uh, more so onboarding an organization or, you know, say a contractor or a property owner, how to, how do we do this winter management thing more sustainably? But, but the easier way to look at, at this large set of standards is really, you know, boils down to six standards of policy that begin with measuring. And so we, we really stress the measuring um, which, which boils down to measuring your outputs, you know, so whatever material, I mean, that as much as salt is a problem, uh, salt and sand or sand even is even, even a problem as well. And so we, we don't necessarily limit ourselves to just salt. It's more, it's more so whatever material is being used. Um, we, we, we want, we want to stress measuring that, because if we want to improve upon that, if we want to reduce it, we have to first understand what that looks like. And that's really what the Sustainable Salt Initiative was meant to do initially was to create a standard set of benchmarks that then we could point the industry to, to say, ah, we, we know after measuring, you know, millions of tons of salt, um, you know, what, what salt application really should look like versus what maybe it looks like now in, in your business or on your property. Um, and then we're also measuring level of service, and uh, we do that through a set of site weather stations that measures air and surface temperature, and then move on into, you know, the calibration process of, of how salt should be applied. And so I think that's like the measuring, the calibration, and then the prevent, you know, the prevent policies or the prevention measures really is where we start to see almost immediate improvements um, when, when we don't come upon resistance. And so when you think about, you know, all these trucks that you probably see on the road and you see on the parking lots, I guarantee you 80% or more of them out there have either never been calibrated or they may have been calibrated once when they first received either the piece of equipment or the vehicle when it was new. And then nobody ever seems to repeat that. And so, you know, our standard of calibration includes calibrating you know, before the season, calibrating during the season uh, multiple times, at least once a month, just to make sure that the salt outputs continue to be consistent at whatever rate we designate. And then anytime there's been a change in, in the equipment or in the, or in the material. And then when you think about the prevent policy, you know, again, I go back to you know, you see these same policies up at the top uh, row here. So, I mean, you can see all the different types of prevent strategies, but the first is, you know, really anti-icing or preventing the bond of snow and ice. If you're a private contractor or a uh, or an owner of a private property, we even include service-based contracts. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, particularly in your market where you are, um, that market is primarily either a time of material 
or a uh, a per event uh, based contract, which you know the that also includes like a per application um, uh, measure that's that's being billed for. And so a lot of these contracts that are out there um, on the private side of the industry, there's really no incentive to be efficient. And quite frankly, salt is also an efficiency tool in that, you know, if I have if I have two inches of snow that's sitting in the parking lot, which is quite a bit more realistic in your market, you're not necessarily a heavy snow market as far as lots of heavy accumulation. However, you do get enough frequencies of events where many times if I'm a contractor, if I'm even a municipal operator, many times it's just more efficient for me from a time standpoint and from a you know required capacity of trucks or equipment it's a lot easier for me to burn it off with more salt rather than plow it off and use less salt. So these are these are some of the uh, the standards and strategies that we we try to implement. And then we get into this whole analysis improvement optimization process, which really that's that's really meant to facilitate the continuous improvement process. So okay, we've gotten down to twenty percent reduction, but why would we stop there? And that's why I say. Uh, you know, where we've been able to implement this, where we've been able to onboard these standards, typically over, a, call it a three to five year period of time, but we're speeding up the, the, the success rate on that now. So it's become more of a, a two to three year period of time where you can, you can go from whatever, whatever mark you're at now, we, we generally are seeing a consistent 50% reduction in salt use. And, you know, again, why we make that a, uh, the business case for that is because anytime you can save on the amount of material you're applying, you're going to save money. Um, and that's, that's just a bottom line. Uh, so just to give you a sort of a broad view of what our process looks like. So we, we start at really a, what we call a season zero. And then that's why I say like continuous improvement really usually starts to be enabled somewhere in that, that year three to four to five year period of time. And then, that's where uh, where where folks want certification, where they want accountability for continuous improvement. That's that's usually where our business model falls into that. But again, this just gives you a little bit of a uh, an overview of, of how we at least try to approach it at a at a practitioner's level. And then you know, again, simplifying that though, if you really think about you know how does this enable innovation, it, it's it's helping to in a lot of cases on the private side of the industry, it's helping to inspire uh, more incentive-based contract models rather than, you know, what I described before is either time and material or per application, uh, you know, so like right now, the really the two biggest drivers of salt use that, that I've studied extensively really boils down to, you know, most folks thinks, think that the main driver is liability, but, but I've, I've learned through our research and through my own personal research on this, I wrote a little thesis on this, which I'll share with you, but um, the two the two biggest drivers for salt use is the economics and the perceived level of quality. So people want the crunch, right? And um, and people, you know, contractors and, and the like actually want to be able to save money, you know? So even if I'm a municipality, is it cheaper for me sometimes to just put more salt down or is it cheaper for me to go ahead and send more trucks out to plow? And so there's lots of these different reasons why these, these drivers and variables occur, but it's, you know, when you have frequency based and quantity based incentives for applying salt, it just stands to reason why salt reduction can be so, so difficult until you, you sort of take that incentive out of the picture and then, you know, again, let, measuring your level of service, measuring your outputs, preventing the bond, and then, you know, getting into the, the, the types of optimization technology, which is really improving every day. I mean, Brine is one specific optimization tool, segmented plow technology where, you know, you don't have just a straight blade anymore, but you have, you know, blades that actually conform to the contour of the road surface that allows you to get more you know, accumulation off the roads and, and allows you to, to use less salt if, if you're being conscious about it. And so these, these are just some of the, the simple, simple things that we try to help facilitate. So the, uh, the thesis that I did write on this, so I have, I have done my homework on this and I, I, I point this out only because it's been interesting. 
I wrote this, uh, I studied this for two years. I worked on it for two years. And, um, you know, through that process, um, that's really what the genesis of this whole, this whole swim program, these sw swim standards, this is the genesis of that really originated from this thesis work. And why I like to show this picture is, um, uh, hopefully not to seem like show offy necessarily, but to, to say every time I go in here and find out, you know, where it stacks up in the most downloadable uh, documents, if you will, from Harvard Library, it's still in the top 10. And I think the reason is because of the, the conversation we just had before this, Aaron, was uh, it seems to be it seems that more and more people are becoming aware of this and looking for information on this. And so it's it is it is this pollution issue at an epidemic level that, you know, that's why I always try to be a part of these these uh, these roundtables, because I, I think we have an awareness issue more so than anything else. And I think groups like yours can really help with that. You know, our 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 job really is to help folks at an implementation level. And I think we need a lot of other organizations, a lot of other people talking about, you know, this is a problem and this is why it's a problem. So so anyway, I just. I just I, I like to be able to support your mission on that. Um, so the the sustainable salt initiative that I spoke about earlier, really that that was a, a sort of a, a self created research project that we did with industry and with the industry associations to, you know, we've been measuring salt use on over three thousand properties in in uh, twelve states, two provinces. I think we're actually in more of those now, and then. You know, we've been over, we've been measuring over you know two million tons of salt over that period of time now, and and you know looking at over you know five hundred million sort of data points based, you know basically GPS salt tracking measures, and then matching that up with level of service, um, and we do that through this this camera technology. So our mission, quite frankly, is just simply you know protecting the water, right? But but the incentive is protecting properties in a lot of ways, and 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 how do you do that? sort of an ec 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 uh, economic level. We, we have a big goal, and I think this is what's exciting is, at least in our work, is, you know, our goal is to really help reduce by over 5 billion pounds of salt each year. And, and the way that we're, we're going to do that, we're, I think we're about a third of the way there now, where if we could, if we could uh, onboard these standards that would affect 50,000 acres of parking lot, 5,000 miles of roadway, we would achieve this goal on an annual basis. And so, you know, usually in a live presentation, I love to ask the question, but I'll just give you the answer. Like a lot of our salt and, and think about it in your market, most of your salt that's in, that's being applied in your market um, is coming from overseas on barges that look like this, and then they hit the ports. Right. And so, so 5 billion pounds of salt looks like 50 of these barges. And so keep in mind, each one of these barges has somewhere between 50 and 55,000 metric tons of salt on these barges. And so um, I was actually just at these piles yesterday up in uh, one of the ports up in Baltimore. And so what you're looking at here, it's it's a little hard to depict, but if you sort of look to the left of this uh, of this picture, there's a there's a tractor trailer, and that tractor trailer is going to hold anywhere between uh, you know 70 and 80 tons of salt. And each one of these piles, there's actually another pile you can't even see in the picture. Each one of these piles, you can see how high it is compared to the truck. And then it runs about a quarter mile down. It's a, it's a quarter mile long, and there's three of these. So this is this is approximately what a, what 150,000 tons of salt looks like. And this pile will go away very quickly. Like this pile, these piles will go away somewhere mid season, and another pile comes in. And then there's hundreds of these piles at these ports up and down the east coast. All of these piles came from somewhere else other than the United States. Did you know that? So not only are we polluting our water with this salt, but we're polluting it with salt that comes from somewhere else. Um, and so just sort of the economics of that and even just even the carbon footprint of shipping all this is just, it, it's sort of a compelling debate that I have in my mind as well. And I just, again, I think most people don't realize that, again, most of this salt is coming from somewhere else. 
So really what inspired me to get involved with this was, you know, we, we first got, we, we first knew about where a lot of this salt pollution was coming from back in a, in a study was done back in 2008. So, you know, over 10 years ago, and this is what compelled me to get involved with it was, I even would have thought as well that most of the salt's got to be coming from the roadways, but it, it stands the reason that most of it's coming from parking lots because if you think about it in these terms, if you think about um, like a lane mile of road, so so a, a center lane mile road is mile down, mile back, back. A lane mile of road itself is one way, right? One side of the road. And a lane mile road is semi-equivalent to an acre of parking lot. So if you think about like route one commercial area anywhere down the East Coast, if you think about how many lane miles of parking lot on every side of road, it just stands to reason that, ah, that it makes common sense now that this is where it's coming from. And then when you think about, you know, if you think about the state municipal level, the county municipal level, and some of the, the large or even local regional municipal uh, organizations, most of those organizations have a pretty darn good idea and they are measuring the salt. Um, where the industry, which is primarily what I represent, um, it's still a little bit of the wild, wild west. So we have to, we have to be conscious of that. And so, and, and then the other thing that I think is important that, again, this is, this is where your work is so important is I'm realizing now just through our work that it's, it's the same issue everywhere we go. Even when I went out to St. Louis, it's like, is this really a problem here? And I look it up and sure enough, it is. And, um, you know, in, in, in Northern Virginia, just South of you now, the, uh, the Aquacon Reservoir uh, or the sewer shed there, I mean, it's, it's in trouble, right? Um, and even in my own backyard, um, many of the lakes and streams are heavily polluted, particularly in the Adirondacks now. And, you know, this is where I think it's interesting. I, I, I'm actually one of nine members of a, a salt reduction task force that I was appointed by the governor in, in our state in New York. And so it only stands to reason now that, you know, whenever you see New York and California, you know, start making laws or start doing things like this, it, it just stands to reason that regulation is going to follow. And so I think that that's one of the other things sort of the alarms that I start to I start to ring and really just even in our own work I mean you're starting to see um, I was just talking with someone yesterday about updating this map because we're starting to see even more states that have some sort of initiatives like you and so I think we need to start filling in even even your your market at this point but it's going on everywhere and so I just I think that that's where that awareness level is really critically important so that you know, general public, if you will, understands that they contribute to this too. You know, at even every driveway, if you think about it, um, you know, we think about it in the terms of like five gallon buckets, right? So for every five gallon bucket, you can put about 50 pounds of salt in it. You need about a, a, a large coffee mug to treat a uh, 100 by 10 foot wide driveway, for example. Most people are using half that bucket though instead. So I think even that is something that we could we could sort of help enable change for. So I think to sort of wrap up what I have to share with you. So, but we need results in order to convince people. And so these these are some of the results that we've been able to um, realize over the years. And you know, at a retail sort of uh, case study, we we looked at these uh, similar size parking lots where swim was being. Uh, onboarded or implemented and where it was not. And in a lot of cases, we were even seeing three times the uh, reduction in salt use. And then just, just the dollar savings alone, you know, the, you know, in one case here, you see the, the 322 stall parking lot that was costing about 600 bucks, you know, almost $700 per parking space a year. That's, it's an interesting way that retailers look at their parking space compared to reducing it down to, you know, less than three hundred dollars. So that that right there alone um, makes the case for for those that are paying for the salt application. You know, at a uh, at a municipal level, uh, we're very well known now for our work in Lake George, which we've been working on this for. This will be our seventh season working there in Lake George, and 
we've been able to, to reduce the salt use throughout that watershed now by over 50%. We have some municipalities that started sort of as, as early adopters that are, are beyond 70%. And so we're just, we're just very proud of those types of results. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Wegmans grocery store change. And so they, they, they had been piloting this for a number of years. We're actually into an expansion of, of, uh, the program now with them, but, you know, what they realized up front was the cost savings, but have now realized really the environmental impact that, that they, that they not only create in their parking lots, but how, what kind of effect they could, you know, what kind of change they could affect. And so, just very proud of, of our client there for, for the work that they've done with this. And then, um, you know, lastly, something that hadn't occurred to me until someone pointed out, but we, we had been approached by Rochester and Institute of Technology when they heard, heard about some of this, this work with these, you know, following these swim standards. And they asked if they could be, uh, they could facilitate a, a third party, really life cycle analysis of like, hey, what's going on with salt use when you when you implement this? And they came back to me, we were we were mostly going to be interested in how much salt are reducing, but they saw very quickly like, okay, we see, we actually see the salt reduction. It's it's pretty clear. Um, but what we're interested in learning more about is, but it seems like your seems like when when these standards are being followed comprehensively, there's also a savings in the number of, of frequency or applications, which that then equates to trucks being on the road less, making fewer uh, uh, trips, making fewer loads and unloads. And so there was a, a energy demand um, question like, what? how is this as far as saving fuel, carbon footprint, overall energy demand? And so I got very interested with that because I think I think for as much as we've seen a lot of success in our work, we also still see, you know, we experience a fair amount of resistance to in that sometimes the, the salt reduction and sometimes even the cost savings isn't always appealing to everyone. And so there may be another case for particularly like these larger organizations that have a lot of sustainability initiatives um, they're looking for other ways to then say that they're saving on carbon footprint. And so this, this makes the case for that as well, at least, at least contributes toward it. And so just thought it was very interesting, again, that, you know, we it hadn't occurred to us internally. So we were really grateful that, uh, that they were able to point that out to us. And so I've, I got a bunch of other stuff that I could share with you. The questions come up, but I, I know we're limited on time. So I just wanted to give you my, uh, my contact information and, you know, no strings attached. If anybody ever wanted to just email me, I'm, I'm happy to respond. I love helping people with this. And so um, happy to answer any questions if we have time. Thanks, Phil. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, Phil is on a little bit of a time crunch, so we'll take questions now. You go ahead and use the um, hand raise function for that, and I'll call people in the order that I see them. Did you want me to stop sharing this too? Yeah, quickly? it'll enable me to see the entire yeah. gallery. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and start because I did have, um, I saw your presentation a while back uh, with a different organization and something that came to my mind is I'm really interested in the update and technology and innovation that you've been talking about. But, you know, in our part of the, the world here in New Jersey, uh, it's a lot of small municipalities. And how would you go about helping those municipalities update their technology on smaller budgets? Right. Well, I I think, you know, employing the, the KISS concept, if I had to say that first, so let's keep it simple, keep it simple, silly, we, I like to call it, but, um, you know, you, you, a lot of a lot of the smaller municipalities. So I'm I'm a landscape contractor by trade. So just sort of keep that in mind. A lot of the smaller municipalities are, are behave and operate very similarly to just sort of your typical contractor, right? Um, with limited awareness, limited budget, um, limited in in the amount of technology that they have available to them, and so. The good news on the technology side is it's it's become much more readily available 
and much less cost prohibitive. And so what used to cost maybe, I don't know, call it between 10 and $20,000 now cost between two and $5,000. So, and what I'm talking about there is a lot of these trucks still have manual controls versus automated uh, salt control technology. And so it's become much more um, inexpensive as long as someone's willing to, you know, budget for it internally up front. Um, it's very easy to install now. And even if you didn't want the control technology, the, the ability to measure the salt outputs and then analyze that um, you know, you can upfit a truck for a couple thousand bucks and you're in, in a way you go. Um, but I do think someone technology, technology, I just want to be careful with that. Like technology is rent really meant to enable a process. So it's like, so somebody has to be willing to follow a process to actually use that technology. So technology is simply a tool. Um, but that, that would be one way to do it. I think the other, the simple thing that we do a lot of times is, Hey, if you've got, say, even just five trucks in your fleet, let's get one set up with measuring technology, um, some sort of segmented plow technology, and the ability to pre-wet your salt. And then if we could actually just measure the level of service with, with a camera on that route, let's just start there, right? So for 10 grand or less, you could be on your way to, to reducing your salt use by at least half, right? I mean, we just... I wasn't as confident before about the half as I was now, but um, half is like shooting fish in a barrel is what I'm finding out as long as somebody's willing to try it. Right. We'll That's a big that. number. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see Bill McQuaid had his hand up. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. So where does all the salt come from? Uh, Egypt, Peru, Chile, uh, Argentina. Um, it comes from a lot of different places. So great question. Yeah. And, in you know, I live not very far from the largest salt mine in North America um, and they do pull from it, but sometimes it's still cheaper to get it from overseas, believe it or not, than mine it out of our own mines. Um, so that's, that's just a, it's like a lot of things in supply chain, right? It's still cheaper to get it from overseas until you can't get it. Uh, Ryan Jorley. Um, I'm just wondering in the, Instances where you work with municipalities, do you find that uh, municipal officials versus public works employees are the harder ones to get buy-in from? And if so, how do you kind of tailor your message to each audience? Great question. Um, I want to clarify your question first. So what, what, what did you, what's the difference that you mean by uh, municipal officials and like DPW well, I don't know if if you know it's a matter of purchasing new technology or you know the whole process might require not only the mayor and town council to to approve okay. things versus the guys who are actually going to have to use the technology and follow the process. Um, do you find that one group is harder to get on board than the other, and and if so, how do you have to maybe? tweak your messaging to, to get everybody on the same page. Yeah, I'll start with the tweak your messaging because that's exactly right. Is that That's really what our discovery process is first and why we call it year zero because year zero, we, we almost never accomplish anything other than let's just find out what's going on. Um, sometimes it's the, the mayor that wants us to go talk to their DPW uh, because he can't convince the DPW or the highway supervisor, like this could be a good thing. And almost nearly half of the other time, it's the other way around. It's uh, I want to do this, but my board is like, has me handcuffed. So it's, it's, it's almost even evenly balanced resistance. It seems like depending on where you go. So a lot of, a lot of times it just has to do. I I'm glad you asked the question because it, it allows me to stress something that I didn't stress earlier everyone for years everyone thought it was about the technology and it's really not it's about the culture of the organization and so what we've really gotten involved with over years is is human it's a human behavior it's a social science experiment that we really kind of continuing and it's really about culture change 
um, because the 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 science and the data on how you get to the reduction it's 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 so confident now that I I have zero questions about that anymore. It's just a matter of but can I get people to do it? Right. Um, I hate to say it, but it's a it's a little bit like the climate change debate and even COVID getting vaccinated. It's like you, you're just going to have a there's going to be a, a percentage of people that just aren't going to believe it no matter what. Right. And um, so we just try to infiltrate it. I will say, here's the good news that we've experienced, but it's why I don't have hair anymore, is usually what's happened to us is, and, and it's become less coincidental, uh, usually the strongest resistors, if we can just find something to get their attention to say, like, okay, I'll try that. Usually our strongest resistors end up becoming our greatest champions. But you got to get through the, you got to struggle through the resistance first, right? So like I've, you know, in our business too, I mean, we have great relationships with manufacturers. I've given municipalities, you know, twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 plows to just try for a year and like, nope, I want nothing to do with it. But then when I finally get somebody to do it, they're like, you've got to try this, right? And so we're actually, we're now sort of in like a, a FOMO strategy, like the fear of missing out uh, strategy where we're starting to create a little bit of that and some peer pressure and all these other kinds of things that nobody would ever, including me, nobody would have realized 10 years ago, like that's what this was going to take. But that's, that's been our experience. So it's, it's been very interesting. You need those uh, TikTok influencers, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which I suck at all that stuff. So yeah. <laughs> uh, we had one more hand raised, John Cludy. Hey, John. Oh, John, you're muted. Oh, still muted. Still. Oh, there, there we go. go. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I can't hear you through the computer, so I'm uh, I'm actually on my phone uh, listening to this. Oh, cool. Uh, for some reason, I don't know, I can't see your outbox. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you, you showed that 50 percent of the salt use uh, that comes through a watershed is typically through uh, the parking and the municipality use isn't going to have a great deal I and mean, uh, the biggest bang for your buck for instance is going to be dealing with those private contracts um, is there a um, tactic would you recommend Sorry, you broke up a little bit. So you asked me what I recommend, and then the only other word I heard was oh, segment. Uh, how do you, okay, so how do you recommend um, approaching private uh, parking lot segment, which takes up 50% of the salt usage in a watershed? Yeah, simply, well, not simply, but, you know, it's an awareness campaign, I think, first. And keeping in mind, though, why standards of policy is so important like so in the private side of the industry where private salt application is happening the policy is the contract so the policies that are followed on a property is the contract and so we're, we're often and this is why I got very involved with this quickly when I saw that pie chart because I said oh that's our industry and then keep in mind I was the I was the largest contractor of anyone doing this. And so it's like, again, I'm the largest offender, but a, a lot of folks like to point the finger to who's applying the salt. And what I try to share with people is, yeah, but in most cases, it's not the contractor that's driving it, it's their client. A lot of times the contractors know you don't need this much salt, but it's it's either, there's there's a couple of things that happen. It's either, you know what, it's barely snowed this year. And I get paid time and material per application. I need to put some salt down so I can bill it. But more often it's, I put the salt down the right amount. And then my client calls me and says, I don't see any salt, which that should be the case. Because any salt that you do see, particularly after a storm's over, that's pure waste. Because that solid salt in particular doesn't do a lick of good until it converts to a brine anyway. And so, but... The, the, the clients have been accustomed to, you know, perceived 
level of quality, perceived level of safety means I need to see the salt, feel the crunch under my feet, hear the crunch under the tires, like that's become the standard. And so that that's what needs to change, right? Um, or at least we need to shift our mindsets on that a bit. And so, you know, as a contractor, we call that expectation creep. So over the last couple of decades in particular, that the level of service expectation on parking lots and sidewalks has creeped to the point where not only is, you know, wet and black the standard, but now it's uh, crunch. That Now they think they need crunch. So salt's being used as traction now um, without, I think, anybody realizing that's what happened, right? But there's just as many people that slip and fall on too much salt as they do fall on, on ice, right? So it's just it's just an interesting paradigm. I'm not sure. Did I answer your question though? Like how do we how do we deal with it? No, I guess um I guess um you did. I would suspect that the townships and the gotta start somewhere. So it's uh, it would be I guess good for township sprint on yeah. uh, demonstrating uh demonstrating how you can prove how you can put down the yeah, and I think I think that's that's the other thing that happens in every town, every market. It's as soon as you say, "Hey, did you know that there's probably too much salt going in your property?" The first response of the property owner is, "Well, what about the town? What about the county? What about the state?" Good point. And then the counties and the state and everybody else in turn does the same thing. Well, what about all these contractors out of it? Why are you pointing the finger at us? So so we get this happening all the time, right? And so that's why I say, yeah, I think I think the first the first level of of dealing with this is you know some sort of an awareness campaign and then you know at the risk of sounding self-serving but it's like and then point them to us like or point them somewhere where they can get answers well, okay well this is a problem like what am i supposed to do then what is the solution give me a solution like, give me an alternative and uh that was was interesting like the, the whole reason we started working with wegmans years ago actually had nothing to do with the salt. It had everything to do with why is it costing me this much one year and then so much more another year? And then it's like this volatile cost um, cost model that it was because their whole success economically was based on the amount of weather. Um, so, and again, there was no incentive for their contractors to be efficient because they're paying them by the amount. Um, so that just continued to cost them more, right? And, and you know, I admit it, as a contractor, why why would I be more incentivized to use less? It's 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 actually the the sing in any line item in a budget, it's one of the single largest line items of cost and profit. So it's a profit maker. Uh, so why would I use less? Why would I want to make less profit? So so that's why these contract models on the private side are so important because. They're, they're performance-based contracts that actually incentivize to use as little as possible. Um, okay, now that's the reason I should invest in this type of plot. Now, okay, that's why I should now invest in tracking my salt and all this stuff, because now I have a reason to use less. Yep. I, I like that uh, point about expectation management there, Phil. <laughs> right. <laughs> good, yeah. good advice for life, right? Um, I think that. Phil has one more question and then we'll cut it off there because we're running yeah, out of time for this segment. You say the salt doesn't really work till it's wet. How many trucks have that technology? Oh, uh, good, good question. I mean, a lot of the municipalities have it. You might see the saddle tanks. You're probably seeing, even in your market, you're seeing the lines on the road, which is direct liquid application brine. Um, but even the pre-wetting technology at the spinner, I mean, uh, how I would answer that question is, I guess, through my own observations. I mean, we, we look, we see a lot of trucks Definitely less less than half, though. Probably, I would say maybe a third of trucks out there operating actually pre-wet, right? And then I think there's even fewer routes out there that are direct liquid application right now. Um, we're seeing more of it, but it's it's 
you know, it's a slow moving industry too. It's, it's, it's a slow to innovate industry always has been. All right. Thank you so much, Phil. Yeah. Hopefully you can stick around for the rest of this. And I don't know what your time constraints are, but if anybody else has any Q and A at the end, if you're able to uh, hang out and then, you know, always, um, if you have any questions and answers or anything like that, please put those in the chat and maybe Phil uh, can help you out with a question that pops into your head uh, during the next couple of presentations. Sounds good. Um, if you want to, for I am going to actually have to go, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, I hopefully some of you got my contact information or Krista, feel free to. to yeah, well, you just drop that in the chat one more time so oh, everybody yeah. can copy Maybe and paste that. it if yeah. they want. Sure. Um, good, good. Didn't think of that. All right. Uh, so moving on with the presentations, uh, my presentation about our 2022 winter uh, road salt monitoring season uh, will be next. So let me get that loaded up here. All right. If somebody will let me know if they can see that, I will go ahead. Right. We good with the full screen? Yes, good. All right. <clears throat> so once again, I'm Krista Reeves. I'm the Water Quality Program Coordinator here at the Muskinacong Watershed Association. And uh, over the last winter, uh, I had a band of river watchers, our community science-led uh, program here at the MWA, uh, monitor over 42 miles, river miles that is, up here in Northwest New Jersey uh, for the MWA and the watershed. Uh, and I'm gonna go through uh, some maps and some data here, but just as a little background, uh, what we did was follow a protocol that was set out here by the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network uh, by Aaron Stress, who will be presenting next. And what we did is uh, did pre and post measurements for each storm, uh, tried to do a minimum of five to six measurements per storm. Uh, we used chloride strips and a conductivity meter so that we could create a mathematical relationship, a rating curve uh, between the two of those. And we created regions. Since it's a 42 mile long river, that's quite a bit of ground to cover. And we didn't want people driving all over the place in the middle of winter storms. Uh, so we broke it up into some smaller uh, regions and created team leaders so that they had a, a person to uh, rally around when they could communicate around storms and monitoring. So the sites were chosen by both MWA and our interests for uh, restoration, conservation, those types of things, and by river watchers, what they had seen in their local communities. And so this is the map of our sampling regions. Uh, broken apart by color in the upper region there near Lake Moskinetkong, that's region one, the Stanhope area. Below that is region two in orange, that's Hackettstown. Uh, below that in yellow is region three, that's the Mansfield area. Below that, uh, centered around our RRC, our River Resource Center there is the Hampton and Asbury in green. And then from there, Bloomsbury on down to the confluence with the Delaware River uh, is region five in blue. And so, you know, it's great we created all these, uh, you know, data points. So what did we do with them, right? We collected all this data and we created these rating curves, right? I know math, everybody's favorite subject. Uh, well, you know, these are important equations and I'm sure a lot of you recognize this rise over run or sloped intercept formula from algebra, right? And you thought you were never gonna use it in your whole life. Well, I use it constantly. Uh, we create these relationships between the chloride and the conductivity so that in the future, we don't need to go and use these disposable chloride strips. We can just take a handheld reading with a conductivity meter, or we have several stations, sensor stations out there that are continuously uh, collecting conductivity data. And then we can then, once we have a robust enough equation here, enough samples, that means, that we can go ahead and infer what that chloride level is. So just to give you a little bit of background, I know some other people are gonna go through this, but some numbers I really want to put into your heads is the standards for chloride levels in New Jersey and through the EPA federal levels. Uh, acute toxicity, meaning for aquatic life, 
is at 860 milligrams per liter of chloride. Chronic, meaning over a four-day average, uh, is 230 milligrams per liter. And for human health levels, it's at 250 milligrams per liter. So what happens above these levels, right? Uh, well, it inhab inhibits the reproduction and growth of fish, uh, extirpation of sensitive insects, meaning they're extinct within a certain area. They'll, they'll leave an area, they'll be wiped out. Uh, mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, all those pollution intolerant uh, insects. Uh, it's lethal to freshwater mussel juveniles, uh, the, glo the glochidia, the, and it impedes their growth. Uh, it leads to die off of, of aquatic plants and primary producers. So it can lead to what we call trophic cascade. If you take away all of the vegetation for everything else to eat, everything else can you know, crumble around it, right? So that leads to decreased biodiversity. But what about human health, right? This can cause human health issues. It's not necessarily the chloride that causes the human health issues. It's the sodium part. Uh, we all hear about heart healthy diets. Uh, well, this has been found to be five times higher in affected wells where we see the salt intrusion, right? Uh, the town of Knowlton right here in Warren County is in the process of suing the DOT uh, for salt intrusion in a certain part of the area. It's um, north of where the uh, RRC is located, near 80, uh, where they get a lot of traffic. And so they're constantly plowing. It, it's a bridge that crosses the Delaware. So, you know, they've been diligently applying salts, but what has happened is that they've come to find that they are finding levels of beyond the FDA recommended 2,300 milligrams a day, which is about one teaspoon, five times higher than that. And those with heart conditions should have less than 1,500 milligrams per day. And so let's look at what we found in the Muskinet Kong area. So this is region one, remember the Stanhope area. These are our sampling points. Most of them were chosen because they were uh, downstream of bridges or therefore inputs into the river, or they were an area of concern for the local river watchers that were uh, monitoring these locations. And so what we found, this is the chloride data right here with the date. So if you look across the bottom here, this is along the winter. These are our points, right? And so what did we say? 380, that's the acute level, right? Or the uh, uh, chronic level. So that's right about here. And this, this is our rating curve. So you can see that all of the data we took has a really nice relationship. The closer it is to one, uh, the R squared here, once again, sorry about the math. Um, it shows what a good relationship we have and how good our sampling technique was. And then we can really start to rely on this data. Uh, so the hot spots for region one, we come to find uh, Waterloo Road. Uh, that's right below where Continental Drive goes over um, the river and right north of Waterloo Village. Um, and it was an after storm reading. And Old Waterloo, which is downstream of that new bridge they just put in. And it was also an after storm reading. Region two is in Hackettstown. So these are the sampling points. And once again, we see pretty much lower levels, none of them going up to that acute level, all of them staying below 300. And once again, a pretty tight curve here so that we can rely on that data. And so that we find the hot spots in that region too. We're here at East Avenue. That's where we're taking out that dam remnant downstream of that bridge. And that was again an after storm reading, meaning they've already applied the salts and some of it's washed in. And then we have behind the Dairy Queen, downstream of this bridge right here by Minebrook Golf Club. Um, and that's a long-term river watcher site. We've been taking data there for over 14 seasons, I think it is now. And here at Kings Highway is a very well-traveled bridge. Um, and again, down, downstream of the bridge and, and an after storm reading because we're doing pre and post storm readings. So region three is Mansfield, so moving further downstream. And so once again, not even reaching 300 here, all of our readings were below that 300 threshold um, and only a couple of them getting on beyond this um, 200, not even really a couple, just a couple, you know, that one there. And again, a pretty good relationship knowing we can count on this data. And we have two violations here. 
Above 230, we have Hance's Brook, the confluence with that tributary and the main stem right here. And then Stevensburg Road, which is directly downstream of that big parking lot, if you know that area, right there off Route 57. Uh, it's pretty, it's almost adjacent to uh, Hance's Brook here. Uh, so that's, but it's also downstream of that bridge after a storm. So both of those, again, are after storm readings. In Region 4, we have the Hampton and Asbury uh, area here, and this is where our River Resource Center is, our office. And so for that region, we once again have pretty low level readings and a good relationship, knowing we can trust that data. But we do still have two violations, right? We've got New Hampton Road downstream of that bridge and after storm reading. And again, at Hampton Borough Park, that's downstream of 31. So that's a pretty major uh, bridge right there. And that is also an after storm reading. And then the last region is pretty much south of 78, uh, where it crosses the Musconet Kong. This is Bloomsbury all the way down to the confluence uh, with the Delaware River here. And uh, as you can see, they're all much lower, even below the 200 level here. And we do have a good relationship and no exceedances in the lower part of the river. So excellent. None of those exceeded the 230 or even got to acute levels. So how does this look overall for our watershed? So as I said, we have no acute standards exceeded. We have 10 exceedances for chronic standards. We have one here, I think Bill McQuaid took um, in Hampton. I think it was way, way late in the season, probably late March or something like that. He dug up a couple of uh, strips that we found because we did run out of the chloride strips um, late in the season. And so for the average for our monitoring season, we found that we had about 117 milligrams per liter. And for, you know, I've, uh, I've always suspected that the Musconet Kong had higher inputs because we always have high conductivity, uh, but we are a lime influenced river. So we have that karst uh, geology underneath the river, which I think is definitely elevating the conductivity, but not elevating the chloride levels. And so what are our next steps here at the watershed, right? We're gonna keep monitoring. This is just one season's worth of data. Uh, we're going to, I mentioned those sensors that we have in, we have uh, almost nine of them in, we have one more to put in. Uh, we have these continuous sensors. And so if we take enough of these chloride readings, we can then just with those mathematical equations infer what that is with just the conductivity data. Um, with all of this data, and Phil's data and everybody, everybody else's data, we can try to be data driven and talk to state DOT and local uh, Department of Public Works and try and ch change some hearts and minds and see if they can get some updated technology, continue to educate the community with river watchers trainings and a well testing program. So as of next season, the NWA is going to initiate a well testing program uh, to you know see what's going on, not just with salt, but other uh, parameters that they can check in their water. And so uh, at this point, I'll take a couple of questions, but I would like to hold off with uh, part of the main discussion until after uh, we're done with everybody else's presentations. I don't want to uh, run out of any time here. So please use the raise hand function if you have anything to ask now. Excellent, we'll save them all for later then. All right, so we will move on to Erin Stretch. She is with the Watershed Institute and she is the coordinator for the New Jersey Watershed Watch Program and I will turn it over to her. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Krista. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, is that showing up? Yep, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Hello, and thanks to you all for joining us this evening. I'm Erin Stretz. I'm the Assistant Director of Science and Stewardship at the Watershed Institute. We're a nonprofit organization in Pennington, New Jersey. We focus on central New Jersey. Um, but uh, through a program that we run called the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network, uh, we coordinate with other organizations all throughout the state. So what is the Watershed Watch Network? It's a program that is hosted by us at the Watershed Institute. 
funded by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, we are basically a service provider to other organizations. We kind of respond to issues that they're having with their monitoring programs, provide individualized technical guidance on study design, on quality assurance project plans. Uh, we'll, we'll train and test and accredit volunteers so that the data is eligible to submit to the department for regulatory use. Um, we create standardized templates, and also uh, in the uh, winter, in December of 2020, uh, we launched our own internal New Jersey Salt Watch program. Uh, now, this program was based on the, the winter Salt Watch program that was created by the Isaac Walton League of America back in 2017. Uh, they uh, began this, this kind of infrastructure of getting these chloride test strips, mailing them out to individuals, requesting them from all over the country. And they created a place for that data to, to come back and land. Um, so it's, it's really um, musky kind of adopted the program from the Watershed Watch Network. We adopted it from the Isaac Walton League of America. Um, ultimately, all of our data that we collect, we also share with Isaac Walton. So um, our data here in New Jersey, we, we do keep it and analyze it for our own purposes, but we do share it out as well. Um, so how does that test work? Well, number one, uh, you head to our website, njwatershedwatch.org slash road salt to request your chloride test strips. Um, I have to admit, I was kind of poking through the, the list of participants here on this webinar today, and I can see that uh, many of you are, are existing participants. So um, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you who have uh, participated so far. Um, if you're new, uh, you can head to that website and start participating. Uh, so you get out to your site, you, you grab a cup, you dip it into the stream. Um, you could use a solo cup if you have access to the stream and can just kneel over. Uh, you can attach a cup to a broom handle and, and kind of stick it out over the, the water body if you're not able to access it directly or you can put a bucket on a rope and uh, launch it off the side of a bridge if you really can't get into the water body. Any of these things is fine as long as you rinse that sampling container or cup um, once, ideally two or three times before you then fill it up with that water and uh, dip your test strip into the water. So I'm just gonna play this video. You can see you dip that test strip in a very shallow bit of stream or lake water and through capillary action, you see that water rise through the test strip. There's a strip at the top that will turn black when it's, you can see it turning black right now as the water rises up through the strip. And this is an, a quick and easy, simple titration that is happening. And we see the tip of this white kind of peak here. Um, that's gonna tell us exactly um, you know, what number we're looking at. So here, this is about 1.8. So if we have one, this is in 0.2 increments. This lands at like a 1.8. The next step is in comparing that number, Quantab unit, to um, this calibration table that's sent with your materials to find the actual result in chloride uh, parts per million or milligrams per liter. Um, those two terms are equivalent. I tend to use them just like interchangeably, so I apologize. Uh, but at a 1.8, that would give us a result of 49 milligrams per liter of chloride. Um, this strip here, this kind of goes up to a 4.2, you know, that would be, we find 4.2, it's 175 milligrams per liter chloride. So it's a pretty simple process. Um, the calibration table that is sent out with the test strips it is very specific to that lot number. So you can see this is uh, one of the bottles that I had. Um, you can see the lot number here and this table is printed on the side. And it's this exact table that we recreate for those, um, the sheets that we send out with the kit. So uh, just wanna make a note that that is important to, uh, to make sure you're matching those up because that calibration table can change pretty dramatically between different types of test strips. The final step in uh, the volunteer process is then submitting that data to uh, the Watershed Watch Network website. Head over here, there's a simple button, submit your road salt data. Uh, for the volunteers who are working directly with the Musconet Kong Watershed Association, you'll have your own method for submitting that data, but I wanted to share this for you know, the, those folks who are unaffiliated 
um, how they get their data into our system. So since December 2020, we've been able to gather um, just over 1,300 data points all across the state. Uh, we have some in the, a lot in the northern part of the state, a lot in the central, we're kind of missing some spots in South Jersey. Uh, but overall, we've had 162 individual folks participate from 36 nonprofits, eight schools, and 15 um, local municipal groups, environmental commissions, green teams, and things like that. So when we look at the state of New Jersey, where these spots are distributed, this is a map of uh, what our data points looked like in, in the height of winter, January and February of 2021. Uh, so you can see, uh, you know, green means good. Uh, if it's less than 100 milligrams per liter of chloride, that's really an ideal condition for freshwater systems. Uh, this, this kind of neon green is in that moderate range where we're approaching that New Jersey water quality a, a chronic standard of 230 milligrams per liter in red means it's impaired, it's above that standard. So we can see that a lot of those red dots are kind of centralized in these areas that are a little bit more urbanized. So um, definitely around the Edison and Rahway area, we see a lot more of those red dots. Uh, we see um, in 2021, we had a, a concentration of that near Lake Patcong. Um, we saw that in the Trenton kind of metro area. Um, also, you know, in Monmouth County, the east side of Monmouth County, it's very urbanized area. You might be thinking, hey, that's the ocean. Of course, there's a lot of chloride. Uh, with our study, we do focus very specifically on freshwater systems. So we, we're not using our low range test strips. Um, in any oceanic or brackish water, freshwater only. Um, but because it's a very populated area with lots of roads and lots of parking lots, uh, we did see quite a bump there in chloride measurements. So looking forward to 2022, just this past uh, winter season, we can kind of see a similar distribution. We've added some sites in the Camden area where we can also see some of those impairments. Um, a lot more sprinkled throughout Central and North Jersey, um, but I do want to highlight this, this strip here in the northern part of the state. Um, we have filled in a lot of those gaps along the Musconet Kong River. So what Krista was just talking about, all of your different segments, that has, is definitely making an impact um, on our statewide map. And you can definitely see um, those red dots and how there were no impairments in the furthest downstream section. That's that's kind of that's fascinating to me, actually. <laughs> uh, but overall, across our 1,300 different measurements, just over half of those were below 100 milligrams per liter. So looking good for a freshwater system, about a quarter of those measurements were in the, the kind of danger zone, but not exactly exceeding the standard yet. And we did see 18% of those measurements exceed the standard. Uh, when we look at the distribution of those measurements, so this just looks on, on the on the x-axis, on the x-axis, uh, we see the chloride measurements running from zero all the way up to 650 milligrams per liter. That's the maximum detection limit. So that's the maximum uh, kind of level to which these test strips can measure. A lot of our measurements, I'm sure, were well above 650. But it's the limitation of our method that really only allows us to get up to that number. Um, so we've kind of categorized them all in this, in this single bar. And now on the other side of this histogram, we see the lower ranges and we see this little gap here. So our minimum detection limit for these test strips, which are HOC low, low range chloride test strips, is about 29 milligrams per liter. There are a lot of instances where people came back with the, um, the measurement below that minimum detection limit, below 29. And so what we're doing um, for statistical analysis purposes, we want to include those results in, in our analyses. Um, they are less than 29. They are very likely above um, somewhere between you know, zero and 29. Uh, we've categorized them at 15, just kind of splitting the difference so that we can see the representation of those measurements on our, on our um, charts and, and, and you know, statistical analysis. 
Um, but it's likely that not all of those measurements are actually 15. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, mention that. But there's a good number of those that were below that standard, which is great. Now, looking at this on a month by month basis, this, this includes both the 2020, 21, 21 season and 21, 22 season, uh, just breaking it down into the months. Uh, we're doing the same kind of categorization. Green is uh, less than 100 milligrams per liter or parts per million of chloride. Yellow is in that moderate region. So in December, we did not find any impairments, nothing above 230 milligrams per liter all across the state, across two winter seasons. Then January comes around uh, when we are starting to see snowfall, we're starting to see salt applied to the roads and some of that accumulation over time. So we do start to see some impairments and that increases a bit as we get into February, just over 20% of all of our samples collected throughout the state are impaired or have been impaired in February. That declines a bit again when we get to March as the winter season comes to a close further in April. And then although we have um, only three <laughs> samples that were collected in May and June, none of those three um, exceeded 100 milligrams per liter. So we do see kind of an increase in the number of impairments statewide in the height of the winter season when, it's, when there's really snow, there's that salt being applied to the ground. Now, looking at this in a, in a slightly different way, we're looking at this again month by month, but, but looking at it based on the weather condition during which that measurement was taken. So green means it has been dry, there's been no snow, snow melt or rain in the past 72 hours. Um, yellow, there has been snow melt. Red is uh, there's been snow, apply, um, snow in the last three days and salt has been applied in the last three days. And blue is kind of a, a catch-all of rain and melt and all of these different things, but primarily rainfall for the blue. Now, because this is crowdsourced data, uh, we do have an MA category as well. Uh, so it's kind of hard to standardize exactly which data you're requiring people to submit along with these measurements. So um, yeah, that gray area is just kind of, we're not really sure what the exactly the weather condition was. But we do see uh, that the median level, which is this black bar, is highest in January under wet conditions. There's also quite a bit of a variation in those measurements after a snow melt event. Uh, so after snow has fallen, there's salt on the roads, that snow is melting, we're starting to see some of those higher ranges of chloride um, during melt conditions. Now, when we look forward to February, we see those variations in the uh, snow category really start to balloon. So again, this black bar, this is the 50% mark. So anything below that, half of our measurements fall below that, half of our measurements fall above that, and we see um, some of those measurements really skew north in, under the snow conditions in February. In March, that sort of starts to, to normalize a little bit. Um, so it's interesting, the snow median kind of stays the same. Uh, so 50% of these measurements are in this very narrow category north of that median. Um, but the variability really starts to come down a bit. And then when we get into April and December, we don't really have snow, we don't really have snow melt, um, but we are seeing um, those the, a lot of that variability happening again. Um, but overall, the medians tend to stay around the same levels uh, from month to month. Now, when we take away the months, when we just look at all of these weather conditions as a whole, uh, we can see uh, that this blue line, this is our 100 milligram per liter line. Anything that falls below that is really in that like really comfy freshwater category, very low chloride levels. Most of the medians under dry conditions, snow conditions, snow melt, and our NA category, of course, uh, they fall below the 100 milligram per liter line. It's only the wet condition in these winter months where that falls above 100 milligrams per liter. Now the red line, that's our 230 milligram per liter standard, our state standard above which uh, that site is regulatorily impaired. And we'll see um, a lot of those uh, kind of outliers up above that mark. 
So when we look at um, the median, um, we see the wet condition had the highest median. So uh, more of the wet samples were higher than 100 milligrams per liter. However, when we look at the arithmetic mean, um, we see that the highest means are happening under snow and snow melt conditions. So really what this is telling us is that a, a lot of the samples are below the 100 milligram per liter standard, but we have um, a good deal of those outliers occurring above that. So that's kind of pulling that median northward, pulling that arithmetic mean up. And um, we see more of the variability, uh, more of the deviation really happening under snow and snow melt conditions. Now, this is looking at it in a, a, from a different study that the Watershed Institute uh, did this past summer with our Streamwatch Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring Program. Uh, this is a summer program where we were had volunteers going out to collect bacterial data, but we also had them grab uh, some samples that we could assess for chloride. Hey, why not? And I'm so glad that we did because we found some really fascinating results here. Uh, so we only had uh, the dry or wet condition and NA still, of course. And I've included this 230 line for reference. Now, again, in the winter months, when the, when the salt is actively being most of those medians were below the standard. In the summer months, our medians were, were very, very high. We're very far above our 230 milligram per liter chronic uh, standard here in New Jersey. So you can see the means here, the medians below. Um, we found that because in the summer months, we really don't have as much water, like the volume of water in our systems is lower, but the amount of chloride stays the same, or it could even go up as um, it kind of leaches out of soils and gets into the water column itself. So we see the concentration of chloride really, really rise in the summer months. Um, and we saw rather than in the during wet conditions in the winter months, it went up because we, we could see like the kind of runoff of that of the chloride into the water body. In the summer months, a wet condition kind of diluted the water and ended up lowering the chloride concentration in our water bodies pretty substantially. Uh, so looking at our winter data from the New Jersey Salt Watch program combined with the summer data from our Stream Watch program we find a pretty stark difference in uh, how many of our sites that we're monitoring are impaired. Uh, when we get into August, when, when it was pretty droughty this year, almost 100% of our samples were not only above 230 milligrams per liter, but well above 230 milligrams per liter. Now, when we look at that data comparing and the upper sections of our, some of our local sub watersheds versus the lower sections, um, it, it kind of brings this into light. So these are two sub watersheds near us here in central New Jersey, um, in, near Princeton, the Stony Brook is on the left and near Trenton, the Assunpink Creek is on the right. And in our region, the upper sub watersheds tend to have uh, less impervious surfaces, they're less developed. Um, in the lower subwatersheds, we have more impervious surfaces shown by the, the red color here. And we see the percentages of the of relative impervious surfaces above. Lower Aspen Peak has 28% impervious surface, while the upper Aspen Peak has 18%. Now, we'll look at, at the chloride measurements that we took this past summer. The measurements from the lower subwatersheds, where it's more developed, are in the pink. And the measurements from the upper subwatersheds are in the blue, where it's less developed. You can see a pretty strong relationship between um, development and impervious surfaces, the amount of roads, the amount of parking lots and, and buildings and sidewalks, um, and the chloride concentration. Um, so we are seeing uh, in New Jersey a, a definitely a strong relationship between um, places that we can apply road salt and chloride impairments in water. Uh, so it, it was very interesting to see what Phil had mentioned earlier, kind of drawing a, a connection to exactly where that chloride is coming from. 
Um, that's a, that was, is a fascinating study. And I'd love to be able to reproduce that. We're kind of getting at that in our own way here in New Jersey, um, but we're definitely finding the same connection. So uh, looking, kind of widening our picture to the entire uh, United States or the continental US rather, um, the Isaac Walton League of America, they amassed all of this data from all over the country for this last season. And we can see a lot of those data points kind of came from the Northeast and from uh, you know, the, the Midwest. And we saw very similar results to what we found locally, the 18% of the samples uh, all across the US were considered above uh, the 230 milligram per liter mark. They're considered impaired. Um, you know, just over half of those measurements are below 100 milligrams per liter. So the results that we're finding in New Jersey are, are pretty consistent with the results that we're finding all across the country as well. So um, if you are, uh, volunteering this winter already with, with us or with the Must Connect Kong Watershed Association specifically. Thank you so much. We literally could not <laughs> collect this data without your help, uh, but I'm going to give a, a shameless plug as well. And if you're not already um, involved, please visit our website and we would love to have you. So thank you so much. I'll thank you, Erin. That was excellent. And I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up um, and that you guys did some work over the summer. Uh, we didn't have time to do that, but I, that's on our radar to do this summer because I was um, reading a study by Stroudwater Research Center and you know it shows that summer base flow is, is extremely important because uh, salt water is shown to be four times more toxic to those sensitive insects at 20 degrees C than it is at 10 degrees C. So the warmer the water, the more lethal that that chloride is to those insects. And so, um, yeah, that's extremely important, especially over a drought like we just had this past summer, where we were seeing most uh, you know most of our freshwater systems in the 25th percentile of flow, so very low. Oh wow, that's that's a super. I did not know that that about the wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much the Must Connect Kong hangs out over summer somewhere around like 100 cubic feet per second. And most of the summer it was hanging out around like 70. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that's 100 is median and 25th percentile is, is uh, I think it was 80 and it was in the 70s for most of the summer. And so, right, the chloride doesn't go anywhere. It, it just accumulates. And that's part of the problem is that uh, it doesn't degrade, it just builds up within the system and it can become diluted, but in those summer months when you have less water, it just accumulates as well. So I'm yeah. really glad that you guys did that. Does anybody have uh, any questions for Aaron at this time? If not, that's fine. You can hold them till the end, but put, uh, go ahead and do the raised hand function. I see Ryan, go ahead. Hey, Ryan. I guess it, hey. <laughs> I guess this could be for Aaron or Krista. I mean, is there any are there any studies out there that estimate the residence time? I mean, would there be any way to do like a, uh, you know, like they do like carbon, or like tracers, isotope stuff to see? I mean, is there any way to see how long salt, you know, it takes from it to go from the road to be flushed out of a river system? Or does it never leave? Yeah. Krista, I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that, I, but I think that's a really great question and a really great driver for future, uh, like a literature review, basically. Yeah, I, um, I don't know the exact answer to that, Ryan, but I do, I have read a couple of papers on sodicity, which is the amount of salt uh, that can be held ionically in soil. So there is a limit to what soil can hold uh, you know, before it's actually saturated with salt and it pushes other ions out. So you're losing, you know, all your other nutrients to be replaced with NaCl. Uh, but I don't know like what the residence time would be uh, before it flushes out. Now I do know that some of the summer flushes can be higher than they actually are in winter. You have that accumulation um, all throughout the winter and then you get that really first big rainstorm uh, once snow melt has happened. And, and that's where you'll actually see some of those highest flushes. Uh, if you have a conductivity meter hanging out in the, the river, you see some of the highest flushes um, with those first big couple of storms over your summer. 
months, but I, I don't know the residence time. And that is a good question to look into. Anyone else? Excellent. Thank you so much, Aaron. All right. I'm going to hand it over to your NJDEP counterpart, Debbie Kratzer. Uh, Debbie uh, works for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and she is the person that comes out and helps us get certified for our quality, uh, quality plans so that we can collect data and turn it into the DEP, and they can use that data for the integrated report. So take it away, Debbie. Thank you. And I can see your presentation. Okay. Um, so since salt dissolves in water, as we've been talking about, we, a lot of times we expect the precipitation to, to just wash the salt away. But as we've learned from the other presentations, that um, unfortunately doesn't really happen. Um, by the 1970s, impacts were being documented from road salt on vegetation, well water, streams, and ponds. So it's only really gotten worse since then. And the picture of road salt impacts has been uh, becoming more clear with more and more research. And Clyde it gets retained in surface water, groundwater, and soils. And I believe that same study talked about residence time, but I don't have like the, the answer in my notes, but I can definitely share, share that with, um, with people. Um, so, but the point is that the, um, as everybody's been saying, this, the um, salt levels don't go back to background levels before the next winter salting begins. And so the salt is just building up. So salt is not the only source of chloride, but it is the main one. And um, Krista had a slide on, on the, um, the standards. So I'll just move on. So this one, New Jersey DEP, is required by the Federal Clean Water Act to, to conduct a biennial assessment of the overall health of New Jersey's water and to take appropriate steps to restore and maintain and protect our water resources and their designated uses. So the designated uses are like fishing, um, swimming, and drinking. Um, as you can see from, from this GIF, and I'll play it again, um, this shows from the integrated report from um, 2002 to, um, to 2020, showing that more subwatersheds have been um, designated as not attaining the standards for total dissolved solids and chloride uh, more and more each year. And um, so in 2020, the most recent report, there are 39 assessment units um, impaired for total dissolved solids and eight for chloride. So I forgot to say on the previous slide, total dissolved solids includes other ions besides um, chloride, but chloride um, tends to be one of, one of the main ones. And this, um, the impaired watersheds, uh, subwatersheds are partially within 128 municipalities in New Jersey, so almost a quarter of the municipalities in the state. So when we started to see that um, chloride and total dissolved solids are um, becoming more and more of a problem, we wanted to take a little closer look at the data. So we downloaded data from the Water Quality Portal, which is an EPA database of water quality data. Um, and we looked at data from 1997 to 2018 statewide. And so this graph shows the median concentration of chloride um, during that time period and showing that it is um, trending upwards statewide. 
And using that same data set for this one, um, this shows the percent of samples that exceeded the standard, the aquatic life um, chronic standard for chloride and for total dissolved solids. And the exceedances are also trending upwards over the years. And this one shows the, date, the same data, but by month. So as, as Erin was pointing out in her data, the uh, same thing is showing up in the state data is that more and more of these exceedances are happening in the winter months. So specific conductance is a measure of the um, electrical connectivity of the water. So it includes um, chloride is one of the, the big components of that, but also other, other constituents in the water. Um, but it's re related to, um, it's an easy way to measure. Um, and as um, Krista's presentation showed how um, the relationship is very strong between specific conductance and chloride. So the um, DEP Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring has been deploying continuous conductivity meters um, since 2011. And this map just shows the locations and um, showing some of the, the red dots are the, the, higher, the higher levels. And just generally speaking, the more urban watersheds had higher means and ranges of the chloride and TDS. And those were um, shown by grab samples for TDS and chloride that are measured in the lab, as, as well as through the continuous specific conductance measurements. And this um, shows an example of that specific conductance data collected in a pristine watershed Dunfield Creek at the Delaware Water Gap, and there's really no, no um, development in that, in that watershed. So the red line on this graph shows the specific conductance data, and um, it really doesn't change at all. So the, the, um, the blue bars are the snow events, and the purple line is the precipitation. So no matter whether it snows or whether it's rains in this location, it's not affecting the specific conductance. So keep that in mind when we look at the next slide. In the next slide, this in this slide, the um, the top graph is that same data from the previous um, the previous slide at Dunfield Creek, um, and then comparing that same five day period. Um, to a nearby but more developed watershed called Rockaway Creek, and um, but with the um, the same um, y-axis, so they so that they can be compared to each other. So the the specific conductance at um, Dunfield Creek is so low that it's right there at that zero mark, so it's a little hard to see. But at Rockaway Creek, you can see that right after it snows or rains, the, um, the specific conductance really peaks because of the road salt that was being washed into the creek. So just summarizing the water quality data analyses, so we've identified that there are increasing trends and impairments in TDS and chloride in our surface waters. And we've identified that the highest values and exceedances are often occurring in the winter after application of road salt. So I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm briefly gonna go over the stormwater regulations concerning road salt. So one of the things that, um, that the municipalities, um, highway agencies and um, uh, have to, do is to have a permanent structure for the storage of their um, de-icer chemicals. They have to um, have procedures to prevent 
and have good housekeeping at their maintenance yard. So like sweeping up spills. Um, their salt equipment has to be cleaned with, with a dry method like shoveling or sweeping before the vehicles and equipment are washed down so that the, so that's not like another source of salt. Um, they have to do monthly street sweeping and they have to remove excess piles of salt um, that have been deposited um, you know, when they're, when they're spreading. And that has to be done within 72 hours. Now that was implemented in um, 2020 for the highway agencies, but it will be new for um, municipalities uh, beginning in the, um, the, the new MS4 permits that, are, that will be implemented in 2023. Another new um, requirement is that municipalities will be required to adopt an ordinance that requires um, private salt storage piles to be um, to be sheltered, like like the municipalities themselves have to store their salt. Now um, this is going to be applied to um, other sources, and the pictures on the right of the slide um, show the example of like when just a tarp, the blue tarp is over this uh, salt pile. And this um, picture was taken in August. So for the entire year, like all that salt was just gradually going down the drain. Uh, so that's no longer going to be allowed. Um, and then the final requirement is that um, the employees will need to be trained and reporting on the activities. And DEP also has a snow removal and disposal policy. So when we get those really big snowstorms, sometimes the uh, snow has to be um, removed from areas and stored somewhere. So this relates to that. So that snow can't be dumped in water bodies, wetlands, stormwater basins. Um, there has to be a plan for where that snow is gonna go and to manage the um, the snow melt so it doesn't go right into our streams. And then some of the additional um, measures that uh, like Phil talked about are touched on in the highway agency guidance document under, um, but listed in the chapter for optional measures. Our next steps for, um, addressing road salt from the DEP side. We have a uh, restoration grant that was awarded to the Brick Township Municipal Utilities Authority. They're working on uh, setting up a workshop for um, like DPWs about some um, best management practices that can be implemented. They'll have a report and also a pilot implementation. We're also working on a white paper, which is like um, kind of summarizing like the data that I just presented in my uh, tonight and uh, some additional data and um, a total maximum daily load to address the chloride and TDS um, impairments. That process always includes stakeholdering and an implement implementation plan. And um, in addition to that, I'm working with Sustainable Jersey to make a uh, municipal action for road salt. And we always continue to collect data and analyze the data um, for additional areas. And this is my contact information. Thank you so much, Debbie. All right. Um, one thing I'd like you to clarify, just because I'm sure not everybody knows what an MS4 is. Could you just briefly explain the MS4? And, and what those permits and you know the the upcoming ordinances would mean. Yeah, I'm just trying to I, I'm trying to no problem un unshare. <laughs> <laughs> Which button was unshare? Um, I have new share. Oh, I got you. There, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Gotcha. <laughs> um, MS fours is um there's four M's, so municipal, oh gosh, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, What's the separate storm sewer, right? right. So <laughs> just, right, so there's two separate right. storm, storm sewer systems, basically. 
Right. So, um, so it's it's the it, um, it's just the abbreviation for um, the re stormwater requirements for municipalities. So municipals, separate stormwater systems, right? Gotcha. So, there's... so yeah, I, I just wanted to explain to people that might not be in the know. There's a lot of acronyms we use, and so yeah. <laughs> so, I apologize. so it's just it's just all about how how your wastewater, basically stormwater, is being dealt with because. Um, you know, in the past, we just had these combined sewer overflows, and that is absolutely detrimental uh, when it rains heavy. These things overflow, and along comes uh, all of the pollution, bacteria, wastewater, along with stormwater. So there's lots of new uh, new storm systems going in that that separate that that stormwater and wastewater systems. And so uh, I think what Debbie's uh, alluding to there is that with the new new storm sewer systems, there's gonna be the um, ordinances for the salt that goes into them. So I, I think that's really interesting. And so with these new ordinances, um, and I saw you put the 1800, or that's 1877 uh, Warren NJDEP, but I just wanna make everybody aware there's also a really easy to use app out there now that you can either use on their website or you can download to your phone. And it's, you take pictures with your phone, you put in cross streets of where you see something and you can let DEP know and somebody's on that pretty quickly. We use it with HAB monitoring and we know that that is all ending up exactly where it should be. So that's, that's excellent. Does anybody have uh, any additional questions for Debbie before we go to the last presentation? All righty then. I'm gonna turn it over to Allison Madison. She's from Wisconsin SaltWise, um, and she's going to talk about success stories in reducing road salts to take us home here, and then hopefully we'll have a good discussion after this. All right, thank you for joining us, Allison. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, Allison, Wisconsin SaltWise, I'm just gonna jump into my slides right away. I will share that I just added one. I, was a, I wasn't able to join the beginning of this conversation, but I um, joined on while Aaron was talking. And so I did want to, I, I threw it on an extra slide to talk a little bit about um, the current standards and how they're not really protective, because I think that's an important part of the conversation. Um, so Wisconsin Saltway started in the Madison area, South Central Wisconsin, where I have our logo with the city, the county, the wastewater treatment plant, all saying, we have a problem here. We have a lot of salt showing up in our lakes, streams, and also our, our drinking water. And then of course our, our wastewater. In the Madison area, it's not just salt coming in uh, in the winter seasons from roads. It's also salt coming from water softeners year round. So I was hired in 2020 to start growing this partnership out statewide. So began connecting with other municipalities, nonprofits, stormwater partnerships that were made up of those MS4 um, municipalities was mentioned earlier that have regulations to do education around stormwater because they have separate sanitary and stormwater um, systems. So stormwater, of course, is not treated, it just goes directly into our lakes and streams. So that's why we want to make sure people understand that. And the fund for Lake Michigan has been one of our primary funders, so always giving them a shout out. And that's um, what's allowing us um, to do work statewide. So um, like I said, I threw an extra slide in here really quickly. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I would really direct you to the work of Bill Hintz out of the University of Toledo. But what this graph here is attempting at showing you, I know there's a lot on it, is that the current US threshold of 230 milligrams of chloride per liter is not really protective of our more sensitive species. So um, the Canadian threshold of 120 milligrams per liter is a bit more protective, um, but what we're seeing in on the x-axis here, a lot of different study sites from around um, the world actually, and um, what's happening to the cladocerin populations in those study sites as we hit those various thresholds. So a zero um, here is showing us that there's no change in those populations. And what we're seeing at 230 milligrams per liter in some watersheds is that when you hit that 230 milligrams per liter, we've already lost um, 
75%, three fourths of the population. So saying we're, you know, 230, that's a threshold we, we're, we're, we've gone too far. We've gone way too far by the time we've hit 230. Um, by and large, we're, we're seeing in most study sites over 50% decline in population when we've hit that 230 milligrams per liter. So really um, the current research coming out of, I'd say Michigan, Ohio is showing us that we need to keep chloride concentrations under 50 milligrams per liter to protect the most sensitive species. So I would direct people to a webinar that we have um, with Bill Hintz talking about his research. This is from um, a little over a year ago or coming on two years. And then also we had a webinar this June. So both of these are on our YouTube um, with um, Kevin Goodwin out of Michigan and um, Bob Miltner from Ohio's EPA talking about um, kind of you know, what they're seeing in various study sites. So would highly recommend um, both of those resources to people who wanna really understand um, the biological impacts here. So um, I will switch um, gears now though and jump into the practical side of things and best practices. So um, of course, the first best practice is to make sure that people are educated. All of you, thank you for being on the phone call today. Um, a lot of the work that I do um, is doing public outreach. And then um, I'd say the majority of it though is working with operators and that would span municipal operators to private contractors to um, custodial staff at school districts, et cetera. So we wanna make sure that everybody is educated on um, the impacts of salt pollution and best practices. So you can see here one of our smart salting training classes. And um, that's most, um, most of the crew in the room right here are from municipalities, but we do have a class that's also just geared towards people who maintain parking lots and sidewalks. So similar, um, fairly similar content, but um, geared towards those different target audiences. And then um, this is just a clip from um, City Madison Municipal Newsletter that goes out. Um, so getting the resident information out to residents, um, newsletters, little YouTube videos, you know, really trying to hit kind of all of the audiences through various modes. Um, so what are the best practices that we're trying to encourage people to adopt? And you already heard just a little bit about smart storage, making sure that we um, have covered storage with impermeable surfaces. Um, calibrating equipment. So if we're going to be applying material, we know how much material we're actually putting down. Amazingly enough, there are lots of smaller municipalities out there that are not doing this. And I would say the majority of contractors are not calibrating. Um, once you do calibrate, though, you can really move towards pre precision applications of material based off of pavement temperature being the number one thing, um, but various other um, factors that also impact the amount of salt that is needed. Um, Pre-wetting materials, so using liquid salt brine um, to pre-wet rock salt, as well as using straight brine both before the storm as anti-icing. That kind of works like oiling your skillet, so you prevent the bond from forming between snow and the pavement, and you can really decrease the total amount of salt that's needed. Sometimes no rock salt is needed after um, really maximizing mechanical removal through live edge plows um, that can be more responsive to the pavement surface as well as brush tools at the smaller scale. In terms of homeowners, it's just getting out there with your shovel or snowblower early and often, sometimes a broom getting right down to the pavement surface so you can avoid using salt. Evaluating performance, um, having those conversations, how did it go, what, did, what, what, what went well, what um, do we need to improve on, and then of course always communicating with whether it be the client, the residents, um, the stakeholders involved. So I'm um, just showing you again kind of the importance of education, I showed you the classroom piece, also really um, working on those mechanical removal skills, so this is a kind of a fun picture from a snowplow rodeo hosted by the city of Superior. You can see the tennis balls there. The more snow that we're removing mechanically, um, the less salt that needs to go down. So educating operators on the importance of this issue, the what, the why, and practicing that. Um, again, mechanical removal. So making sure that municipalities um, all the way down are um, trying to get out and move snow first. Salt really should just be used to break that bond between snow and the pavement. It's not supposed to be used to burn through snow. 
Um, so making sure that our ordinances or just policies are saying mechanical first um, and getting out there, even if there are smaller amounts of snow and moving that snow off the roadways. Um, calibration, as I mentioned before, is huge. So this is an example from a community just south um, of Milwaukee, they had a truck that, you know, was supposed to be putting down 300 pounds per lane mile when they went to actually calibrate it, it was putting down 850 pounds per lane mile at that 300 pound setting. So just by calibrating that truck, bringing it down, so it was putting down what they thought it was putting down, um, they reduced their salt use, you can see in this case, by um, almost two thirds. So fleet wide, um, when they calibrated, they dropped their salt use by 50%. And then they were able to keep those dollars in their department, reinvest them in their equipment. And then the following year, they had then brought their total salt use down by about 70%. Um, just huge, huge savings here to the bottom line, as well as reductions in, you know, damage, salt super corrosive, prematurely ages our infrastructure. So the payoff is huge. Um, brine, as I mentioned, is a key component of um, salt wise practices. Yes, it is still salt, um, but it goes so much further and it's activated when the salt is RG in solution. So a couple of pictures here from the city of Stevens Point in central Wisconsin, um, their anti-icing truck where they're just spraying that um, liquid directly on the pavement surfaces. This is their Brine Extreme, Brine Maker, some of their storage tanks. Um, another benefit of brine is you can do some mixing, so blending in um, some other chlorides when you have colder temperatures, because sodium chloride, straight salt, only effective down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So you really need to switch away from straight salt when you get below that, which we definitely do in Wisconsin. It might be a little bit more moderate um, temperatures in New Jersey. You can also blend in different sugars, so organic additives that, um, like salt, depress the, the melting point, and sugars also work as tackifiers. They're sticky, right, so they help that brine stick on the road, um, and that's one of the big benefits of brine. Even if you're just mixing the brine in with straight rock salt, you get it to stick on the road surface, stay where you need it to be. You don't have that bounce and scatter in out of the, the wheel tracks, and in sometimes a lot of cases, off the road surface, it's not doing you good. Um, so again, once you're calibrating, you're incorporating brine, this is a little diagram inside the cab of a truck in Stevens Point. So they have here their pre-wet salt setting. So how much salt they're putting down when they're pre-wetting, when they're adding that brine to the rock salt. And you can see here their chart is based on road temperature. So right in the cab here, they've got their sensors. Air temperature is great, but that's six feet up in the um, above the surface. What we really care about is pavement temperatures. That's where we're trying to melt the snow. So as the temperatures drop, they are dialing up their salt application rates. Um, now, I want to make sure people understand this. A set amount of salt is going to melt a set amount of snow or ice, right? Um, you don't need more salt. But what happens at those colder temperatures is that the salt works more slowly. Everything slows down, right? When we have colder temperatures, less energy there. And so we end up using more salt because we want to get um, those conditions back faster. So um, as temperatures are dropping, higher rates of salt are used, but I would say for a lot of municipalities, um, people are still at like 300 pounds per lane mile or above. So even the fact that um, going down 19 to 15 degrees, we're still under 300 pounds per lane mile. We're in a, a good place here at Stevens Point. It's pretty impressive work. And then of course, like I said, below 15, straight salt's not effective. So they are switching over and they're mixing in, in this case, a geo melt. So something that has an organic component for sure, probably an additional chloride when they hit that, um, those temperatures below 15. And a lot of municipalities, counties are actually using those additives when they get down to about 20 because salt has just lost its effectiveness. Um, so those are kind of a snapshot of some of the best practices that we really work to um, have everyone implement. And then um, the expectations for level of service is a huge part of that. So um, making sure that residents understand what municipalities are doing, 
Um, I love the work that the city of Eau Claire in Northwestern Wisconsin does to kind of get that message out through social media. They use a lot of great hashtags and emojis and take photos. These are the road conditions, you know, it's not clear. It's not going to be clear. Leave early, leave space, um, reminding residents what they can do. You know, if you have parked where you're not supposed to, it's going to be harder for us to mechanically move that snow and get us back to better conditions. So, um, yeah, I think social media is a great way to do that. The city of Oshkosh in the eastern part of the state this year just sent out a mailer to all of their citizens, letting them know about the impacts of road salt. You can see here that, you know, damage to our infrastructure they mentioned earlier. Um, for about every dollar we spend on salt, we're doing $10 of damage to infrastructure. Um, that idea, you know, one teaspoon of salt is all it takes to pollute five gallons of water. Um, and then kind of what are some of those impacts? Again, this is research coming out of the, the Bill, Bill Hintz's lab in Toledo, Ohio. Um, then, you know, messaging that like on the ground, you know, we're on UW-Madison campus closing off some stairwells here. We don't need to salt all of these high-risk areas. Um, just close them off They're You know, it's kind of redundant, just huge, long um, step sections of steps. So close some of those off, let people know it's one teaspoon of salt to five gallons of water. Um, this is in a park next to a water body here. So just saying we're, we're plowing this only. Um, we're not gonna be salting here, you know, be careful. And then whenever we have events, we really try to bring the, the meat, the TV, you know, newspapers, bring media, help get attention to show off what communities are doing and how the public understand the importance of that and, and how they can be a part of it too. So just a couple quick pictures of some of the publications that we put out there trying to support everybody um, and getting this message out in print. And then a lot of what we're doing with SaltWise is really trying to promote the great work of municipalities and um, companies. So we have a SaltWise Municipal Champions Program on our website, just like a little um, story map here. So you can click and learn more about what each of the municipalities is doing um, and their, their salt savings. Um, also getting the word out through like, these are some PDFs we put together for an EPA website they're working on on chlorides. So showing salt savings, dollar savings, kind of how they got there. Um, also, so I'm gonna share you a couple of pictures of these equipment open houses have been a really incredible events, um, doing calibration trainings to support that for municipalities, school districts, et cetera. I mentioned the classes already, and then we have monthly webinars that are available. Um, they're live streamed on YouTube, and then people can always are, you know, watch the archives as well. So equipment open houses, um, again, a lot of them um, geared towards municipalities, a few on the private side where we have um, an outstanding community like Stevens Point. Here I have Corey Tees from the city of Eau Claire. Um, we invite municipalities to come and hear and see, learn from their peers who have um, really made strides in um, salt reduction, smart salting, check out their brine makers and kind of have a chance to, you know, kind of kick, kick the tires and not just hear about it, you know, from people like myself, but actually um, their, their colleagues. And these have been really successful events. Mentioned the webinars. Um, we have other resources put together. I've got um, several videos on a researcher who just got her master's at UW-Milwaukee. And we've got a, a lesson plan for high school classrooms um, that's built um, around her work. We've got um, working on a couple training videos, um, a lot of different resources out there. Um, yeah, so one of the training videos we just um, got put together this fall was with the, and for the city of Milwaukee and their um, operators, snowplow operators. This is on the right. Um, a draft of um, some information we're putting together for city alders. So really trying to hit like the various um, stakeholders and decision makers in this process. And then doing a lot of public outreach at festivals. Um, these are just old shirts that have been um, purchased at Dig and Save, kind of like a Goodwill, and then people um, making woodblock prints so they can, you know, learn a little bit of the story um, and take something with them so that they can be saltwise advocates in their communities. 
And then, you know, speaking about that, that education, I really wanted to show off these photos from the city of River Falls. Every year during Public Works Week, they actually host um, a full week where they go around every single elementary school. I think there are nine of them, public and private, throughout the city. And every single second grader in that city gets to come out and take a look at municipal trucks and you know mowers and the garbage truck, um, but also the salt truck. And you can see here some kids with the little the salt spinner. And in the back is the five gallon bucket. So they talk about one teaspoon of salt pollutes five gallons of water. And kids get to learn about how their um, city is really working to reduce their salt use. And I mean, these kids are just love it, right? They get to go up into these trucks and talk to the people who drive them. And so I really think this is where we need to, you know, I'll also be focusing some of our education. So um, yeah, I'd initially put this presentation together for municipalities at the APWA, American Public Works Association Conference. So it says are you a salt waste city, but this just kind of reviews, um, you know, the education, mechanical removal, calibration, use of liquids, communicating expectations. I would invite everybody, you know, if you're not in Wisconsin to join Salt Awareness Week coming up um, in January. Lots of great speakers, including Sujay Kashal from University of Maryland, talking about freshwater salinization syndrome. And then, um, yeah, I would definitely encourage you to support um, equipment open houses and other training events in your communities. And um, yeah, I've got a QR code there for um, Wisconsin SaltWise and all of our social media um, sites a really easy way to get the word out just like and retweet you know kind of share our posts um, but yeah I think with that I'll end my pause my share does that work stop share and um, happy to take any questions so yeah virtual component there is um, so salt awareness week we have a few things um, on the ground but um, every day of the week Monday through Friday we have webinar a webinar um, that's over our noon hour. So for you guys, I guess it would be like 1 to 2 p.m. or excuse me, 1.30 to 2. They're half hour um, webinars with um, experts. And like I mentioned, Sujay, you know, not all of them are in um, Wisconsin, but people talking about various aspects of the issue. That's excellent. Thank you, Allison. I, I like how you had the the trucks out there kind of gamifying the snow removal with the tennis balls. Uh, that, that was pretty cool. I like that. Make it, make it into a game. And I'm yeah, I mean, there is, um, there's a national snowplow rodeo, so I'm not sure, um, if people from New Jersey come out to it, but, um, I did meet some snowplow operators from Maine who are out at the national rodeo in, um, in Colorado this fall. How fun. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And I, I really am interested in those open houses because I think that's a lot of the barriers. People just don't know what's out there and, and they do want to go and put their hands on it and kind of, like you mm -hmm. said, kick the tires and everything. How, how did you start that? How did that get going? Um, so I just started talking to people and finding out where folks were at. And, you know, if we had someone, even if they'd taken some baby steps and they were willing to invite people to come to their shop um, and just have those conversations and get get people started talking about, you know, what rates are they using? Are they calibrating? Like I said, there are still a lot of people who don't even calibrate. Um, but if they are willing to kind of share where they're at, what their equipment is, and I always say, it's just like, let's talk about where we're at and then strategize what's the first step that we can take um, and and make sure they, you know, have that support then, support network kind of from their peers. And I, I mean, like I, this wouldn't be as beneficial for you, but, um, one way to kind of share is that I, the webinars that we have, um, I mentioned, you know, they are archived. So I have like a webinar with Corey Teets from the city of Eau Claire. He was just on last week talking about the work that they've done. Um, so, you know, people in New Jersey could, could watch that and learn a little bit and see kind of where they, you know, measure up. Um, but I would, yeah, definitely encourage you to try to have something happen in person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted somebody outside of New Jersey, a different perspective, you know, see what other people are doing, maybe, you know, always bringing something different to the table. I think those open houses sound, you know, fantastic for operators, you know, to start getting involved in understanding uh, different best management practices. Um, does anybody else have uh, questions for Allison? If not, we can go ahead. Erin, uh, uh, go ahead. 
Sorry, I was looking for the actual hand raise feature, but I just- I saw your hand, no oh. problem. <laughs> um, so um, you, uh, first of all, you just tossed that slide in there. It was like a beautiful, perfect slide. So uh, thank <laughs> you, that's, that's super interesting. And I, yeah, that's definitely an area that we need to explore here um, about the, the actual number of the standard. But anyway, um, so, so you mentioned that below a certain temperature, we start to add in these either speed or just, you know, their efficacy at lower temperatures. Um, but there's, there's like other issues that are associated with those organic additives, like increasing biological oxygen demand, whatever. Is there like a sweet spot that you found, uh, like some kind of brew of the right amount of organics and the right, you know, constituents of chloride uh, that seems to work the best? Mm -hmm. So um, we do have a webinar on brine blends. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, it was shared by Matt Whittem from the town of Lynn. So a town, township, um, in southern Wisconsin. I mean, this is one person kind of sharing out, you know, what's working. He is a winter maintenance professional. So I definitely think there's you know, there's the conversation from the environmental side, right? Um, what do we want to see going into our water? And of course, anything we put on the ground is making its way into the water. Um, and then there's also, you know, the winter maintenance professionals, right? And their number one is how do we deliver these clean roads, right? And we want to make sure what we're putting down is delivering us the results that we need and not destroying our equipment in, in the doing. <laughs> um, so I would say that there's still, there's a lot of learning that's happening right now. And there's a huge um, learning curve there and a lot of knowledge gaps when you go from, you know, state DOTs to counties, to cities, to, you know, contractors. And um, yeah, so what we're trying to do is just kind of continue to bring that education to people. And what I see is if we're able to have a, liquid um a salt brine and we're in those higher temperature ranges from like you know 20 on up there's no need to bring in magnesium and calcium chloride right those are still chlorides we still have the chloride problem and the calcium magnesium chlorides can sometimes actually be more corrosive and um, more threatening um, to our aquatic ecosystems um now the terrestrial might be a little different because as we talk about like sodium, right? When it ends up in our um, soils can displace, you know, calcium, magnesium, potassium, other um, cations from, from the clay particles that hold those cations. Um, but I would say, you know, straight sodium chloride is also way, way cheaper. So using sodium chloride, but then if we can use just a little bit of a sugar, um, and yes, you're bringing up right there, biological oxygen demand concerns there. Um, if you're not right on a waterway though, and that's going to move off and go through any, you know, soils first, like you got a chance for microbes to eat that up. It's not, you know, not a problem. Um, but if by adding a little bit of sugar, we can add much less chloride, then I think it's an overall win. Right. Yeah. And then I see uh, Bill McQuaid, you have your hand up. Yeah, you mentioned uh, freshwater salination syndrome. That sounds pretty ominous. Is that? Uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, so the work of Sujay Kashal's lab, um, they're kind of the folks who coined this term. And part of it is um, the idea of novel chemical cocktails, which is also pretty ominous sounding. Um, and I just want to see if I can pull up um, something for you to just kind of show a visual because I'm I'm a visual person. I think it helps to um, have this. So let me see. I might not be able to do it as quickly as I want though. Um, okay, I'm just gonna explain with my hands. Oh, wait, here we go. Okay, give me a second. Let me pop back on here. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, 
So here, meet Sujay to the right. Um, this is a graphic that I think one of his grad students had put together. This idea that we're just kind of blending everything all together and we're ending up with things that we don't quite know what, what's showing up now in our water. And how um, is what I'm gonna show you in just a moment. So the idea is, um, and I'm gonna focus just on sodium and chloride. He does look at other ions um, that are contributing to this and uh, from other sources, but um, road salt being the primary one. So when we have sodium and chloride that is dissolved in our water, and then that moves down through our soils um, and bedrock. Um, in the soil, we have different ions that are held by those clay particles, right? Clay particles, particles have these negative charges on them. So they have a huge cation exchange capacity. They have the ability to hold positive things. But then when we flush sodium and chloride through the system, the sodium ions take the place and kind of displace some other ions. So I have here like potassium, um, manganese are now released and flushed um, into our groundwater. Chloride, you know, moves down readily because it's negatively charged. So it's not being bound by those clay particles. So um, the, the freshwater salinization syndrome is um, focusing on this idea that, so we're adding a, like some ions, but now we're seeing the release of even more. So higher concentrations of a lot of different cations, a lot of different metal ions, including manganese, it's like radium, different radionuclides that are increasing in our water because they're being released from soils, they're being released from bedrock, they're being released from pipes at higher rates. So part of um, the problem with the, the the lead crisis in Flint was it was it was exacerbated by the fact that they were drawing saltier water, salt water from the Flint River, right? And so um, that led to the release of even more lead from pipes. I put a link to that paper for anybody who wants to read it in the chat. Uh, it is a very eye-opening paper. To yeah, say and I would say Sujay um, does an amazing job of really bringing this information down. I mean, the, these white papers are, are way up here above my head sometimes too, but um, he's going to be our, our kickoff speaker for Assault Awareness Week. So Monday, I think it's like January 23rd, um, would highly recommend that. Oh, that's excellent. I'm writing that down right now. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? Well, this has been excellent. Thank you for joining us, Allison, Aaron, Debbie. I think Phil is gone, uh, but thank you for everyone for asking questions. Um, this has been excellent. We will be following up with a training to do uh, monitoring in the Musconetcon watershed. Uh, that will be going out soon. We will absolutely be using other uh, techniques, as Allison said, I'm going to look into these open houses because that sounds like a really good driver to uh, get these operators to start looking into best management practices. So thank you to everybody who participated and showed up to just educate themselves uh, and to the MWA and uh, the Watershed Institute. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel. So thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you. And I did put my email in the chat if anyone is. Oh, great. Excellent. Thank you.